if you're thinking about buying a piece of technology or upgrading what you've got now, unless it can solve a problem for you or create an opportunity for you, you don't need it. This is the Techsploder podcast, conversations with tech professionals about being human in a binary world. Episode 21, Andy Anatko. Techsploder is made possible by the financial support of our patrons like Joe Gurup. If you like what you hear, head on over to patreon.com slash Jason Howell to support the show directly. And thank you for making independent podcasting possible. Hello and welcome to the Techsploder podcast. I'm your host, Jason Howell, and I have the opportunity to each week sit down with my friends in the world of tech and talk about their kind of tech origin story and really find out how each of our stories in the realm of technology are both different and also the same at the same time. Hopefully that makes sense. Today's guest is Andy Anatko, renowned technology journalist, author, also podcaster, who's been at the forefront of tech reporting for over three decades. He's served as the Chicago Sun-Times technology columnist uh, for many years. He was a Macworld columnist as well for more than two decades. Currently, Andy is a tech contributor for WGBH and PR and co-hosts the Material podcast on the Relay FM network, He's also a regular contributor to the Twit Podcast Network on shows like Mac Break Weekly, and you know he's often a guest that can be found on the This Week in Tech podcast. But uh, we got a lot to talk about with Andy. Had a wonderful conversation that's coming right up right now. Let's get into my conversation with Andy Anatko. What's up, Andy Anatko? It is so great to talk with you. How you doing, man? Back at you. I'm doing fine. It's good to see, it's good to see your face in streaming form as opposed to email form and, and, and audio form. <laughs> yes, indeed. You know, keeping the content wheel turning. That's that's <laughs> the name of the game these days, which is something that you're very familiar with. You keep yourself <laughs> super busy on a on a weekly basis. You know the the kind of the hamster wheel, you know, momentum feeling. Um, yep. you, be, with me with a uh, material and of course Mac Break Weekly, and then we're talking you know pre show of course the Work that you do for NPR, and then you're doing writing outside of that. Like that's your audio kind of content, and what anything outside of that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I do. There, I, I do. Uh, uh, I do a lot of work for other people that aren't like you know. I, I, just, I do some consulting work if, if it seems interesting. Okay. I do some writing projects if they seem interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the writing that I do uh, is has been for myself, uh, having fun because believe it or not, like the the streaming income is enough that if I want to pursue, like I've, I haven't, I'll, I'll put it this way. I have, ever since I left the sun times, I haven't found a venue for tech writing for me. That was mm. as fun as the sun times where it was literally here. <laughs> we we're counting on you to uh, provide an 800 to a thousand word column twice a week. What you do with those 812,000 words is perfectly up to you. If there's a problem, oh, we'll let you nice. know. Uh, it's nice not it's, sometimes you have to pitch something or you have to like it's hard to work mm -hmm. as my dad as my dad uh, said a long long time ago when I was considering taking the, the last time I considered taking an actual like office job he said son I don't know if you're even housebroken for office work anymore uh, it's it's hard for me to work it's, it's harder for me to work under like a structure anymore. Because yeah. again, so much for the, I've had the, that luxury. No matter what I do, of like even for even when I uh, do my uh, my stuff for NPR, it's like I'm on on uh, I have my next segment on uh, on Thursday, and on Wednesday afternoon I will give them like four or five topics and briefing papers on them. If they have a, if they have suggestions for a topic that they want to talk about, they'll give it to me. But mm -hmm. it's not well. We'll have a pitch meeting and we'll shape the show. So it's That's once nice. you get once you get used to certain luxuries, it's hard uh, not to. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to go back to really. I have to give you an outline first. Okay. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> I mean, to yeah, to a certain degree, once you've experienced just flying by this, not by the seat of your pants. I think what it is is at a certain point, you're so experienced and so known to be good at what you do that people just kind of give you the leeway to do that and then to kind of wheel that back and have to put it into the confines of a, this is the room and we sit in the room and we all come up to, with this together. That would be a hard thing to undo. Yeah. And that's, and actually that's part of my, like that's been part of my professional tactics. Like every time, every time a new gig has started up, it's always been, I will spend the first month, month and a half 
working more. I'll spend the first month, month and a half earning their trust. And then after that, they kind of let me go. Uh, Mm -hmm. Once it's once you, but actually it's something I discovered a long, long time ago when I started doing stuff for, uh, uh, for, uh, for TV, uh, where it's like, I I real, I came to realize that a producer is on, especially on TV, especially on like national, like TV news, they, Mm -hmm. I've got so much to worry about every day, every hour, every week. And if you come to them where I will solve this three and a half to five minutes for you, it will all be done. I will write, I will, I will brief like the on-air hosts. I will source all the material. I will give you all the research and all the references. All you have to do is, you know, give it a look over and it will work. Once I find that they're so relieved that I don't have to worry. And of course you back that up by actually bringing the good. Actually doing it. But, yeah. <laughs> but, but once, uh, honestly, once they, once they are, they realize that this is five minutes, I don't have to worry about. And that right. will say, maybe we should ask that guy back. Maybe we should have that guy on regularly. It's nice to have five minutes of a three hour long program where all I have to do is make sure that he hasn't died or suffered a disfiguring eye infection two days, two days before, before airtime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really is interesting. Like, uh, you know, I can only compare it to the kind of the the hamster wheel of sorts of uh, mm-hmm. the daily, you know, tech news thing, you know, doing tech yeah. news today and tech news weekly and, you know, stepping onto that hamster wheel, especially with a daily podcast, let alone TV, <laughs> which is a whole other realm of pressure, but a daily podcast like that. There are needs within that hour that you just have to figure out and fill on a regular daily basis. That can be a bit of a grind. So I'm sure if someone came in and said, hey, you know what? I got 20 minutes of your podcast. You don't even need to worry about it. You can trust me. And, and like you said, they they prove and they back that up with with results. That's just an insane amount of pressure. What yeah. what TV, like I'm curious uh, about this, the stuff you were doing for TV. Like how did that come about and what were you doing that was bringing you onto TV and, on a regular basis? Uh, I, I, uh, I, had, uh, I had the iPhone, the, free, the original iPhone to thank for that uh, because mm. uh, Apple – when they announced it, it uh, if, if people were uh, thinking about tech back then, if, who people are listening, it really became uh, like the I don't know the, the the magic lamp that everybody was really interested in. It was clearly something engaging and wonderful. And as luck would have it, I was one of a handful of people that, like, after it was first announced. Remember that the announcement came in January. It wasn't going to be released until like June. Uh, mm, and like 20 right. minutes after the announcement, I was in a room backstage holding a working, as much as it was working at that time, a working sure. sample. And so I was one of a handful of people who could say, here's what it actually works, look, feels like, here's how responsive it is, here's what it is to, like, to, 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 open the, to, to look at the web uh, through a phone. And so... As a result, for, as a result, so a local local cable there's a local cable news channel, uh, Nesson, uh, New England Camel Cable News, that like ooh ooh we have there's somebody local that like has actually ooh let's get them on, and then oh, yeah you become you become the the obvious target at that point yeah, yeah and sure. and I did well enough that they said let's have this guy on regularly to talk about tech, and then oh and then after that like CBS uh, CBS News later on I don't know what the situation was but it was a no, I think I think it was I think it was still uh, the iPhone uh, had me on to uh, the, the the CBS Morning. Uh, I forget what it's called, but the the CB the, the CBS Morning Show that is has gone mm-hmm. through four name chains. It was basically the show that goes uh, opposite to the Today Show, uh, mm-hmm. and so again, then so they had me on to talk about the iPhone, and once again, it was there was an uh, it, the last email ended with, "Hey, if you got any ideas for tech stories." Not you know, liking to have another free trip to New York City. I pitched them an idea. They said, "Great, let's do it." Pitched them another day. Great, that next do it. And like I was alluding to before, if you deliver, then it's like, mm-hmm. "Hey, we got a slot open. Do you have any ideas?" And obviously, obviously, that's not where show up and we'll, and we'll, and tell us what we're going to do. But at, at least it was the sure. same sort of thing where if I came up with an idea, it's it's just super super fun to f- produce a show that way. To figure mm-hmm. out, like, okay, I've got three and a half to five minutes of 
airtime on national in this in this case in national news how am i going to use it how am i going to take advantage of this you know what can how can i be of service to the people who are going to be watching this and also take into consideration the fact that it's only three and a half to five minutes it yeah, has to be very totally. visual you can't be you can't be like uh, you can't be uh like i want to get into uh a, 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 a interesting twist to government policy regarding the regulation of tech it's like that's not really very showy, is it? Yeah. Uh, but but but, but, it, but it, it, again, it's a lot of fun. And once again, it was nice to have a free trip to New York every month. Yeah, yeah. No, I, having just come back from New York, actually, on a <laughs> on a trip that for a, a conference uh, at the DroidCon convention in New York, and they had a sponsor. They were able to uh, fly me and everyone else on the Android Faithful podcast out there. Nice. And just speaking from that ex- that experience, just like a, a couple of days ago, yeah, it's yeah. nice to get the opportunity. To do that every once yeah. in a while, and and, and can enjoyable. I say, even, I don't do that kind of travel very even, much. Even the hamster wheel is kind of fun. It's yeah. like um, the NPR used to be every week, uh, and now it's like a couple of times a month. The, it was the one fun thing that I kind of lost out on when it was every week is that, um, and this is this is another like analogy that's kind of stick stuck with me. The idea of like uh, uh, of like even the even the the, the greatest professional baseball hitter of all time. Okay. Ted mm-hmm. Williams, you know, best year he hit 400, which meant that six times out of 10, like he was frustrated. And just the, I don't know whether <laughs> I actually got this from like an article about like you know, a game, but the idea of Ted Williams striking out, going back to the dugout, beating the hell out of the water cooler, but then you got to get over it because you got, you got another at bat, like in, in, in about 45 yeah. minutes time. Right. That's, that's another thing that kind of gave me optimism that the more at bats you have, the less it matters that you you you, you score on that particular one. So it's fun okay. to like like uh, uh, th- this uh, on Thursday. Uh, I'm I've got my lineup. I'm putting it together, and a lot of it is wow. There's so many like the the Department of Justice uh, against uh, Google is such an interesting thing. There is mm-hmm. there's also again ABC all these policy stuff. I want to talk about some practical stuff too. When you're in, when you have more at bats, you can say, "Actually, here's just a goofy thing I came across that I kind of like that I'm going to be fun to talk about." Here's a chunk. Here's a nugget yeah. of it. And and so yeah. and so there's so I think that part of getting along and getting by and maintaining your happiness and your sanity is knowing that no matter what you're doing, there is an advantage to it. There's a there's something particularly and uniquely enjoyable about it. Find it, hold on to it, enjoy it, treasure that, and don't think about. Oh God! I gotta come up with something to do. Something next tomorrow. I guess something to do the next day. Or gosh, I, I'm not sure. Gonna be, I've only got one book, three and a half minutes a month. Well, I'm going to use this three and a half minutes. Yeah, yeah. No, that what what comes to mind for me with that is kind of something that you know in my current paradigm of what I'm doing. You know, have a YouTube channel, have some podcasts, have three podcasts. Three podcasts alone <laughs> is a lot of work. That's a lot let of alone, work. Let alone also supporting a, a a YouTube channel and feeling like okay, I gotta I gotta be on that hamster wheel and, and produce <laughs> content and you know there's got to be something original and you know from what you were saying and and translating that over to what I'm doing right now, it's this constant question of like quantity versus quality and not that not that like I feel like oh I should just you know not produce something of quality it's not that it's just how much effort and like attention to detail is necessary yeah. for a single thing versus like if I was to do you know put 100% of my effort into this one major thing versus putting like 70% of my effort into this thing and then moving on to the next thing and that reserved 30% goes over and you know like is it's hard to know the best way to do that when you're talking content and I, I imagine that's you know there's there's some similarities between video creation and podcasting and then also the the content that you choose to write for all of these different places yeah but but again that I there are time I have a lot of projects that have been going on for I have one project that's going on that's been going on I'm not joking for 15 16 17 years oh, uh, wow. and it's a person it's a personal project and but yeah. the it makes me appreciate the problem of deadlines where mm-hmm. it's 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 never going to be done but it is unfortunately due so get it done <laughs> but release it when the, when people are expecting it or when you've told people you're going to release it yeah, uh, otherwise get it done enough yeah it's it's so i mean it's so easy to get precious about these things yeah. oh, i mean for sure you got i mean you have to you can't say, you know each sentence has to be an 
unallayed gem of perfect truth, beauty, <laughs> and wisdom. A heartbreaking work of staggering genius. Like, okay, dude, you're 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 talking about the new camera button on the iPhone. Yeah, dude, yeah, yeah. Let's make it readable. Let's make it fun. Let's make sure you represent your point of view. But the Pulitzer Committee is not hanging on your every word here. Just just publish it while at a time when it's actually useful to people. Yeah, yeah, it really is a, a balance point um, because you can go like because I can appreciate the desire or the want to be that, you know, have that much attention to detail. But yeah. I know for myself, I just don't have the patience for it. Sometimes I don't have the patience. Like I've got a video on a timeline and I just like I hit a point where I'm like, I just really just want to publish this and oh, move on because like I 100%. can continue going on every single little detail for hours and days. And I just I hit my um, my kind of limit as far as uh, having the patience to kind of continue going. And so sometimes it's just like, all right, good enough, yeah. go. I got to tell you, I have to admire you for getting into video that way because I've tried so hard to it's get hard. into to get into video and I it's just as you say I get it's I have fun plotting out what I'm going to say I have fun recording it and then it's like okay but now you got to edit this stuff there's so much technical stuff and making this yeah. all work and I never figured out like a workflow to make it efficient like what's the stuff that I should be sweating over what's the stuff where okay it's easy it's you can just be yeah. simple and direct with this I mean mm -hmm. and meanwhile uh, 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 you and I are at a disadvantage because uh, when you look at the videos that are being made by a younger generation that maybe didn't grow up with camera phones, but they did grow up with iMovie, they did grow up yep. learning in high school about nonlinear editing. Like there's a there's one of my favorite YouTubers is uh, a creator by the name of uh, Rachel Maxey, uh, mm -hmm. and she is such a brilliant storyteller. Uh, and, it, and it does turn out that she, she did go to film school, but she talks about like in high school, again, being on the, the, the school iMac editing videos. Right. And that's, that's the sort of thing that I'm, I'm talking about where just as I, uh, you and I are probably the first generations that grew up with word processors where mm -hmm. it, where it frustrated you know, people who are just like five or 10 years older than us understanding how a word processor works, whereas we learned how to write with the idea of just put a sentence and a paragraph out there if it stinks, yeah. highlight, delete, or just backspace a lot because we're talking about Apple Writer 2 probably. But, you know, <laughs> and so it created, I think it created a lot of people who write a lot better than previous generations. And mm -hmm. so it's, uh, I really envy those people who have that sort of green thumb for video storytelling because I certainly don't have it and I wasn't able to cultivate it. But you know what? A lot of things are hard when you start to get into it. A good sign that you're onto something that is kind of nourishing and fulfilling for you creatively is when your reaction is, wow, that really sucked. I can't wait to do it again. As opposed yes, to, wow, right. that really sucked. Why am I doing this? Yes. Oh, totally. Yeah. That, that kind of existential, uh, dread versus curiosity <laughs> almost. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, I will admit from my own per personal perspective, there are days where I have both, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> There's, there are days where I wake up and I have that dread and then days where I yeah. wake up and I'm like, no, nah, man, let's go. One thing, one thing that really, um, came to mind for me right there in what you were saying is watching my daughters and them with, technology and specifically with you know social media networks like TikTok you know very visual video driven networks that are built around like foundationally built with like tools for editing yeah and mind you they aren't like adobe premiere tools but the concepts the whole the, the whole thought process is the same it's just with a different, you know, maybe a sim more simplified tool set or something that's just easier on a smaller screen, you know, meant for point uh, tapping with your finger and yeah. stuff. And so what I realize, especially in my older daughter who does have access to TikTok and she kind of creates her own videos and everything is just like you said, how naturally that form comes to them. Yeah. And meanwhile, this is a skill that you and I, you know, we, we had to really educate ourselves around. Now it's just kind of part of you know, the, the, the oxygen of a, of an iPhone or a, an Android device is Oh yeah. yeah, that app's on there. They have an interest in that app. Therefore they're going to learn pretty quickly how to edit for that type of video yeah. and yeah, stuff she comes up with. I'm like, Oh my <laughs> goodness, you know this now. Yeah. This is crazy. What and, this it's, it's such a telltale. We can, you can tell it's, it's fading out a little bit now, but like, especially five or uh, maybe 10 years ago on YouTube, you could really tell that cutoff between mm. generations because there were younger creators who were who understood the form perfectly 
And then there are the ones who are like, ooh, wow, I can make my own TV show and release it on YouTube. And like I'm I'm thinking of one person in particular. I won't I won't name them because it's not about like the person, but it's like, wow, you put together like this. Uh, he, he was he was famous enough as a blogger to put some money into it or find a sponsor or whatever. And he built a set and he built mm-hmm. he had this big intro and he had these recurring segments and like not necessarily special effects, but where it's like you are trying to make a TV show. TV show. <laughs> whereas all you needed to do was put a certain amount of money into making sure your microphone is good, your lighting is good, your camera is good, and just start talking. You don't need the 30-second. Uh, there, there's another one that uh, I'm uh, differently who, like, I, they produce good videos. And again, they're, they're uh, Generation Xers. But like the first thirty seconds is hi, me and my I and my me and my wife have a co- have a collectibles business and we travel the entire country looking yeah. for collectibles. Now you can share it like I I I've seen one of your videos before. I know what it is. You don't have to yeah. spend thirty seconds. Like just you can just jump in and yep. go. And yep. again, there's so much that I love seeing the how uh, unexpectedly technology can shine a light on how different generations progress, how, what their attitudes are, what their upbringing was like, what their environment was like, what their priorities are like, not by them making a video about it, but by here's how you produce, here's how they produce a video. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Um, you, you have always struck me as a highly creative person. Like it, it seems to me and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that creativity is kind of core to, who you are. I mean, you're a writer, you're, you're a podcaster. We, an assumption that I've made about you, and I don't know if this is correct or not. So tell me okay. if I'm, if I'm far off, off field here, were you an actor at some point? You have a very kind of theatrical presence oh. about you. <laughs> no, no, no. That's an assumption that I've made. And I apologize if that's an assumption that, that you don't like hearing, but there's something about like your, your presence and your delivery and everything that I've just always assumed. Like, I bet you, he was, I bet you, he was into acting when he was younger. Like, I don't know, I don't know what it is about you, but I I think it, I think it's a a very unique kind of uh, thing that you bring to the Mm. table, the content that you create. And when you're on the podcast, you're just a very engaging person. You know how oh, you, you know how to present yourself in a way that is captivating. And so I just always kind of assumed, like you, okay, you've had training in the in this to some degree, but no, it's no. just who you are. <laughs> I'm. I mean, that's that's very flattering. I thank you for saying it. That's it. it uh, if it comes from anything, it's um, kind of like not wanting to waste people's time. Uh, yeah. And hope and well, actually, mostly it's because I'm just having a, I'm trying to have a good time. If I'm having yeah. a miserable time, then that's there's something wrong. I need to back off and either try something else or try something again. Uh, because I, I, I'm so blessed that I've never had a job that I've really hated. I've had lots of jobs in yeah. this uh, in uh, being a, a tech journalist that I didn't like certain parts of it. Uh, but I've always had the power to, okay, so do we have to keep doing that or can we jettison that? Uh, so yeah. otherwise it's so easy to burn out. Um, I, they're uh, getting, getting back to YouTube. I see some people who have these channels that are getting like about maybe a thousand subscribers and maybe 50, 60, 70 views. And cause I'll see it like linked from someplace else on Reddit and I'll check out their other videos. And they've been doing this like for, <laughs> for like two for or three very, years, very they've got like mm-hmm. 300 videos and the most views they've ever received is like 700 or 800 800 views and i have again so much admiration for that because they're not doing it for external validation they're not doing it for the money they're obviously doing this because they either they're uh, they're clinically obsessed uh and and the the quality of their work is too good for just clinical obsession or they just simply enjoy it and the work is vita est laborum the work is is what it's all about the work is worth it what makes it worth wow yeah yeah, it is. It is interesting to see that there's a lot of people on YouTube that, yeah, absolutely, that they're they're doing it purely because they love it. I mean, the same, you know, the same could be said about podcast. And you know, you yeah. you and I both have a long history in podcast. But there's a lot of people that get into podcasts and they have the assumption that, like, if I start a podcast, I'm going to start making money. And I think, and which is increasingly more and more difficult to do nowadays. Yeah. It's, you know, it's kind of gotten to the point to where if you were established then, then you're doing okay now. Uh, starting from square one right now, you've got a real, you know, 
tall hill to climb to get there. Um, but often the advice there is, you know, don't start a podcast because you want to make money. Start a podcast because it's about something you enjoy, something that you love, that you can talk passionate about passionately about on a regular recurring basis yep. every single week for years and years. And eventually, potentially, that passion connects with people who share that passion. And, you know, maybe that turns into a business somewhere down yeah. the line. Yeah. That, that's why uh, it I don't say I wouldn't say it gets me concerned, but uh, so at the uh, at the YouTube Creator, I don't I don't think it was a Creator Con a couple of weeks ago in New York City, but they had YouTube had an event, yeah, yeah. and so, uh, and they and they announced a whole bunch of AI tools that they're putting into like the YouTube like Creator Hub or whatever, and one of them was if it was the they enhanced the brainstorming tool to, with AI. Mm -hmm. So that okay. they so the and the pitch to the creators was hey if you if you don't have an idea for uh, for for a video use the brainstorming tool and it will help you like develop ideas create an outline and as always when Google talks about their creative AI tools no matter who it's for it's like no it helps you brainstorm gives you a launching pad gives you convers starts the conversation to trigger things in your head uh, right. and I appreciate that I do think that they believe that. Uh, their fundamental idea of AI uh, assistive, excuse me, uh, creative AI is not to do your homework for you, but as a collaborative effect with uh, with uh, with a human being. But right. it really did seem as though it'd be very easy for someone who read an article about you know Mr. Beast or whoever it is, the latest person who like is making eight million dollars a month off of YouTube videos. Hey, I'm going to start a YouTube channel too. I have nothing I want to talk about. I have not. I'm not excited about doing this, but. I've been told that one can make money off of this. And if you're using this algorithm, which um, uh, I saw, I don't think it was in any of the press materials or the interview materials, but I think it was something that was said on stage that part of what the AI is doing is not just saying, oh, well, gosh, you're an arts and crafts blogger of autumn is, uh, you know, Halloween is coming up. How about decorative uh, pumpkins or decorative schools? A lot. Some of the the AI is saying, "Well, I can see that this topic is trending, or these videos on the, these topics is, are getting a lot of views. Uh, how about a topic on this? And if you get that done in the next forty eight hours, that's the sort of stuff that yeah, that's that's a really oh, boring. Boy. That's you're not going to get a great yeah. video unless unless you are a, one of those Dick Clark type of people who can just or who can just be like in, feign enthusiasm about damn near anything uh, and i've <laughs> right. never been again i'm we're gener we're generation x we don't we don't we can't even have genuine enthusiasm about it yeah what is enthusiasm i yeah. don't even know it's lame <laughs> that's what enthusiasm is just lame <laughs> <laughs> Whatever enthusiasm, yeah, le left me out of the the equation. Enthusiasm doesn't care about me, therefore I don't care about it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's that's so interesting. I so I've used some of the AI tools to kind of understand, you know, for for creators. Like there's this one tool called VidIQ, yep, and. And, you know, of course, it has all these these tools within there to come up with ideas like you're talking about or to title your content. And yeah. it always cracks me up because when these tools like if I've if I've created a video about the, you know, the, my Pixel 9 review, let's say, and I run it through this tool, it always wants to come back with, you know, you won't believe the blah, <laughs> yeah. blah, blah about the Pixel 9 or Pixel 9 um, exposed colon, blah, yeah. blah. It's like all of these grand, like, proclamations about, like, scandal or you know, that, that thing you'll, you, uh, you won't find in something else. And that's where I'm like, man, is there a generational difference where I'm like, I can't bring myself to do that. Like I even tried it <laughs> once and it felt weird. And so I ended up yeah. changing the title cause it just didn't work for me, but maybe that works for an algorithm. Maybe that's what you actually need to do. And I just don't know that I can bring myself to do it, but it's, you know, but it's fine too. I mean, the, the yeah. fact that it gives you stuff that you reject at least it prods you. Well, I don't want it to be like that. What I, what what I like. Yeah. And you're also you're also pointing out one of the uh, one of the things that I really I'm really really uh, uh, using generative AI a lot for, which is because the, the worst the, the, for me the hardest thing to produce is a title of an article. I'm I'm, I'm so glad that yeah. I'm so glad yeah. that this, for 20 years of the Sun Times I didn't have to come up with a, with an article title ever. Okay. Uh, I would make I make might give a few suggestions, but. Honestly, there are times where, uh, like, I had things so things were flowing so well in my head. It took me less than an hour to write it. Uh, but then, if you if you asked me to, like, I have to come up with the title. That would be a half hour in and of itself. Yes. But the but I the totally. ability to simply say, uh, go into Gemini or go into ChatGPT and say, here's an article. Uh, give me ten proposed 
uh, headline uh, titles for it as a blog post. Uh, and again, maybe one will be run out of the money. Maybe it'll be okay. I can see where that is the kind of the good, that gives a, a good, me a launch pad good. for an idea yeah. to tweak it or whatever. Yeah. yeah, and and there are and there are also you have to admit that there are. Um, it's important not to undermine uh, inadvertently your own efforts. Uh, there's so many uh, YouTube videos, blog posts, whatever that are titled like "Some Thoughts about the uh, about the I- about the iPhone uh, <laughs> about the new iPhone," and it's like that doesn't tell me anything. It's no unless unless I know no, right. absolutely who you are, unless I'm already like a big fan of your work. As opposed yep. to, and again, you, you want to shy. You definitely want to shy away from. You won't believe what I found out about. It's like uh, I'm not. I'm not sure that this new iPhone. Uh, 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 I, I'm not. I'm not sure this new button is a good idea. <laughs> Which is basically, if that's one of the big things in your in in your in your blog yeah. post, great, put it if out it's there. Represent at least. It, at least yeah. it gives people like something to hang on to. Yeah, but there's always something to learn. Something yeah. unique. You can't be a prima donna. Yeah, no, that's that's very true. I think um, one of the challenges that I've that I've had is I can create a thing, you know. Maybe this is you know similar with writing, so along the lines of what you were just talking about with the title, I can create a thing, and I can know how I feel about the thing that that you know video is about, but pulling out that single that singular. A nugget from it that could be kind of like the the appealing or interesting defining you know promotable thing from it is really hard for me and that that is yeah. one of those things that you know a second a second set of eyes or an ai or something along those lines can at least start to start to kind of crack you out of of your kind of general malaise at that point you know because because yeah. so, same thing you're talking about a half an hour titling things i've totally been there where i'm just like you know again going back to my impatience level it's like i just want to get this out the door like why why <laughs> yeah. am i spending a half an hour looking at this title wondering which is the right one to go with like why don't i just like pick one put it up and if in two hours nothing's happening change it or what you know yeah. what i mean like i don't know until i know well that's that's yeah. it but isn't that always like super super fun there there, there's so many times where uh like uh, my usual uh my usual route through uh like the news the the daily news is like i'll be in bed and i'll just be scrolling through uh, like rss feeds and i'll be flagging things for me to read later on and then you come back to it like three hours later and the title is completely different or it's like they they decide that that, and i know that there are algorithms uh for uh, so some of the some of the bigger CMSs will do things like when you publish it will publish it with five different titles and then like a half hour later whichever one gets the most clicks becomes like the canonical title for the oh, entire wow, thing yeah. and then and then you and the, or then you look into the URL and you find that oh the URL they, said something was, different but they're not going to change the, the URL title. yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> right. and and again I mean it's it's not it's not cheating it's not misleading but once again it's like once you have something written and finalized. Why wouldn't you want to use whatever knowledge exists yeah. to help other people find it and read it? Short of misrepresenting yourself, short of like putting one of those thumbnails of like Oh God. <laughs> yes, I know. I yeah. know. Although I had a conversation with Renee Ritchie, I can't remember a couple of years ago, and one of his points to me was like you know, it feels weird. It feels, you know, the, your ego definitely gets involved to do those types of thumbnails. But at the at the end of the day, he's like, Jason, you just got to get over yourself because you know what? It works. Yeah. And but and <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah. but yeah, know. and 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 it's okay because they're not. YouTube isn't demanding that you do this. If you don't want, yeah. if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. Yeah. I'm. Yeah. I. I just. Yeah, I just see it as hacky. Actually, there are there are more than once I have unsubscribed from a channel. Mm. Like we we all have these channels that are kind of on the bubble where we yeah. don't watch every video, but occasionally they come up with one that's really interesting, and you'll watch. Yeah, yep. Some guy again went to one of these one of these panels or whatever, and decided not just to go to, Whoa, but also I'm going to Photoshop big bulgy eyes and like, uh-huh, and uh-huh. I just hated so much seeing those thumbnails in my feed <laughs> that I unsubscribed just so that I would not have to ever see them again. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. And I totally get it. 
I totally get it. And I don't think you're alone either. Uh, need to take a quick break. And then when we come back, um, let's talk a little bit about like, you know, kind of the the um, the starting of your tech fascination. Go go back a little to, to a younger Andy and Akko that's coming up here in a second. All right. So a big part of why I enjoy doing this is because I get to learn, yes, more about you on a professional level, the the guests that I have on, but also kind of like where it all began. Because I think at the end of the day, at the core of all of us who work in tech the way we do, we're passionate about it. That passion began in different ways, but kind of the same ways too. And so those stories are always very fascinating to me. Is there like... Is there like an early tech memory that you have from your childhood or sometime earlier where, I don't know, where you realized in that moment that you were a, a passionate tech technology fanatic? Or is that, I mean, maybe it's something that came later. Maybe it's something that didn't, didn't surface for you when you were a kid. But does anything come to mind there? Um, not, a, not a single moment, but um, I think one of the unpredictable uh, effects of having a computer inside the house is that uh, I think my my parents bought one for the house thinking that because we had it was sort of a large family that okay yeah. we're a great resource for all the kids when they're learning and doing stuff and I don't know why particularly this happened but it really was on the same level of my dad's uh, typewriter from college was a plaything for everybody, and I used to play with okay. the typewriter. We, of course, yeah. had crayons and pencils and paper, and we would draw, and that would be a creative thing. And the computer was exactly another one of those things. It was kind of like a it was an Apple II Plus, and the one of the one of the things that I um, one of the things that again Gen Xers have with their with their childhood computers that uh, today's generation doesn't have is that the whole thing was the whole damn thing was completely open that mm. uh, the, the manuals even had like a, a dump of the of the source code for for the roms everything you took the lid off of it there is every integrated circuit socketed so you could remove them and replace them and yeah. this is a black box for investigation as a puzzle to figure out and then learning how to program in basic and then assembly language and just the ongoing thing of i want to create i, I wasn't i wasn't thinking on this level but gee i want to uh, I, I want to create this or gee i've seen games do this how does a game like actually put a thing on the screen that doesn't look like a character doesn't look like a, a blob like that mm -hmm. and then you learn more about it and it becomes an outlet for creativity and so uh, it's never uh, technology has never been uh, a a tool. It's never been an opposing force for creativity. It's been just another way to express whatever it is is inside your head. Even if the thing that's inside your head is something very very nerdy and very geeky, like mm -hmm. uh, like an assembly language program. Uh, mm -hmm. And and it doesn't it doesn't hurt that uh, at school they were you know they're, they're, the schools are trying to justify like okay we bought these computers I hope people are using them. This is before <laughs> and and the and, and in the early days like teachers had not. The curriculum that involved computers was learning how to program in basic, if that. And so, if you were one of these kids who like liked to play with these things, they would be they would give you like a very very long leash on which to play on. I appreciated that as well. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it was always just. Uh, I, I want to imagine there there's something that I can. Uh, to this day, uh, this is something that I uh, that I uh, is one of my maxims that always comes up usually when there's like a new thousand dollar phone out there that if you're thinking about buying a piece of technology or upgrading what you've got now unless it can solve a problem for you or create an opportunity for you you don't need it and mm, that's so what true. great technology does sometimes it solves a problem meaning that i've got all these like in, in my case uh, uh large language models are solving a problem for me where there are some weeks where there's so much law happening uh, inside uh, inside tech news where I've got 500 pages of court filings and PDFs that I need to get through. I need to get through them in three days because that's when like the next show is on or when I'm on NPR. And the ability to get through all of them to not not do my homework for me, but at least summarize this for me. So, okay, well, mm -hmm. that's that part is interesting. Where do I find that? What page? Uh, and that solves a problem for me. And then there's the, point there's, me in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a the technology that creates opportunities for you. And some of them, and we're not just talking about professional opportunities. We're talking about, we we're talking earlier about, uh, about uh, editing video. Uh, the, the idea that editing a movie in the old days, like in the 70s and 80s, before iMovie, before nonlinear editing, 
mm-hmm. there was such a high bar of entry where you needed a whole raft of technical skills of here's how you physically cut film together. Here's how you sync sound. Here's the way you need to record the sound so that it will sync up later on. So there's the, the, the technical barrier and then the, 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 the money barrier of entry. Mm-hmm. Whereas now that you can just... Uh, today you can just shoot something on your phone not even have it leave your phone not even install another piece of software and cut together just by instinct just by exploration just by playing with the medium uh, a really good storytelling video that's creating an opportunity and so mm-hmm. that's maybe where all that comes from because this that apple 2 plus it wasn't a homework aid uh it was fun uh being the probably the only kid who had a word processor uh <laughs> but uh, it was there because and actually even then I probably would not have had so much fun uh, as a writer if when I was a kid it was no longer it was so easy to play with words so easy to edit things so it easy just I'll just type it out and see what happens and then change it later on if I want to mm-hmm. so that's that's probably where it comes from yeah well I mean that that seems to explain your kind of interest in tech it also seems to explain kind of what you went on to do you, you <laughs> writing you know, writing with computers is a large part of of what you've done over the years and that's that's a direct correlation right there <laughs> yeah that's absolutely awesome. I went yeah. to I studied computer science in college I thought that I was going to be a programmer who wrote on the side and turned out to be exactly yeah. the opposite <laughs> See, I took, I had a fascination in the the Commodore 64 when I was a kid. That was like my big kind of pinnacle computer. When I finally got to college, I took computer science and I was awful at it. I Meanwhile, I thought I was going to be great because <laughs> I love computers, yep. but it turns out there's a lot more to it than, than just that. You know, I'm a great user of technology, but programmer, maybe not so much. There's yep. skills there that didn't come naturally to me, I guess. Um <laughs> You let's see here. So when it comes to kind of the the technology that you were using um, back then, the the Apple II, would you say, or the Apple II Plus? Sorry, would you say that that was kind of the foundation for your interest in Apple products, I, I, like as a whole? Because I mean, you 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 spent a lot of your technology, uh, your tech uh, journalism career writing for publications like Macworld. You were with Macworld for quite a while. Yeah. And and through the 90s, right? You were you were writing uh, for Macworld through the 90s, which is a really interesting pre-iPhone era to kind of see a lot of change with the company. Is that kind of where that fascination or that interest came from, your, your early exposure? Maybe. And part of it is that, like, even in the pre-internet ages, uh, the legend of Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. Yeah. You know, two 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 nerds in a in a garage who just, you know, playing with technology at a and going into a computer club and sharing what they what they know and them hand assembling these computers. Yeah. And that's and knowing that when you are like manipulating that ROM code that you that I found in the in the in the owner's manual that I'm actually mm-hmm. working with the sort with the code that Steve Wozniak himself created, knowing about, oh, this is a kid called Chris Espinosa, who like is pro- about my, was about my age when he joined Apple and started writing manuals and oh my goodness uh that that's i mean that's certainly uh, as a as a uh, as, as a nerd as a teenage nerd to know that okay nerds can make good ner- ner- nerds yeah. is a you, you can have epic epic uh, lyric poetry written uh ulysses homer <laughs> uh, <laughs> hercules and steve wozniak um but yeah i, I think the and, and, and but a big part of it, I think, was the Macintosh because I I still yeah. remember my first interaction with a Macintosh, and the the hair is just standing in back of my neck, uh, of seeing oh my god the pixels they're square, like oh my <laughs> it, just like they're sharp and they're square I've never seen I know I'm, it's like know, looking it's like looking at someone in real life <laughs> yeah it's, exactly it's like it was yeah. such a transformative experience and for okay. a long time uh, Apple products were giving me like that sort of thing uh, uh, regularly and also. Yeah. It helps being like a snotty teenager than a snotty like young adult saying, "Oh, Windows! I never do Windows! Oh my God, Microsoft!" Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. And you know, fortunately, most of us grow out of that eventually, uh, yeah. which leads you into a much larger uh, and much much more balanced world. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 nice to uh, Apple had uh, Apple had a sort of a uh, I don't know what you call it like a halo around it. Uh, that mm-hmm, for sure that uh, the the fact that they came about as a response to uh IBM 
as a response to like the big and digital and the other mini computers that are out there. The idea of like hippies who are saying, well, everybody should have a computer. There shouldn't be a centralized thing that's controlled uh, by the establishment. And it sounds like I'm making fun of that, but that's almost literally what the, a lot of the conversations the Homebrew Computer Club were about. It's like, well, we have these 8080 ICs, we have these 60, new 6502 ICs. That means that we can actually build a computer that you own and you control. You don't have to timeshare. You don't have to beg an insurance company or a university or somebody else for time on their computer. Uh, it's not, if people are going to be free, they should own their own tools. They shouldn't have to lease tools from the company store. Uh, mm-hmm. And so th- that's that also figures well. Of, of course, we're also Generation X, so we were also first. Oh my God, stupid hippies talk, talking <laughs> talking about how the internet should have no, should shouldn't should, there should be no privacy on the internet because you know, information wants to be free. Yeah, well. <laughs> 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 so I'm happy you brought up uh, the internet because this is another thing that I love to kind of talk about a little bit is, you know, kind of we've been around to see the the dawning of the the internet and the, and the way that we, you know, everyone uses it nowadays. We were there in the mid 90s when uh, when it became a new thing and that suddenly we had access to and everything. And I'm just kind of curious to know, like, are there any. Is, is there is there a moment when you first use the internet where you know and maybe it's maybe it's a, a particular part of the internet or a particular technology but something that that stands out is like the moment where you're like oh my goodness this this really changes everything were you actually working at Macworld when the internet kind of revolution began let's say um my uh, I started off at Mac user uh, when I was like 19 I was never on staff I was always freelancer so that start that was 1989. And I remember okay. that. I remember that specifically because I, when I, uh, um, when I got uh, uh, must have been an email. Uh, but yeah, well, you know, we, we we like that that article that you wrote for us. You know, do you want to be a columnist? Like I thought. Well, I have. I'm, I'm glad this happened in 1989 because if like they they're on to me. And like they drop me in three or four months. As long as I can hold on to this for three or four months, I can put on the resume Mac user columnist 1989 to 1990, and they'll think it was two years and crossed a decade as opposed to just like three or four months. Um, <laughs> That's smart, though. That's really smart. Yeah. I had hope for the best, it. expect the worst. Uh, totally. <laughs> but um, yeah. So so yeah, that, that goes That's back. Awesome. A, that goes back a very long way. Um, it's not just well. It's first modems, then the internet. I mean, they, I still remember. Yeah. Uh, like the first time on a 300 baud modem, I see text entering the screen that uh, that almost not a typing speed, but almost a typing speed. The idea of yeah. I've never seen, I didn't write this text, and yet this text is appearing on my screen. This is incredible. Mm-hmm. This is wonderful. Mm-hmm. This is thought provoking. Um, but then when uh, uh, when it was became possible to for ordinary people to have access to the internet, and I mean, it becomes what can I get into? What can I access? And just the idea of getting a weather report from a university in Germany was amazing. Totally. And then, then when Archie and Veronica servers, which was sort of the precursors to the web, because they are uh, file servers that are designed to be open repository. I, I guess the I guess the closest thing for people who are unfamiliar with it is kind of like a shared Dropbox Dropbox folder with public access. Uh, mm. Only, of course, really hard to get into. I mean, you have to have a lot of knowledge to do it. But then finding all this information, particularly information that will get you to the next level of what you're trying to learn about the internet, uh, mm-hmm. that's just, wow, how how much is out there? And that's when it's like, I'm sorry that I have to go to work at 9 a.m. I'm sorry that I have class at 8 a.m. because <laughs> it's now 7.30. There's no point in going to bed because... Um, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but uh, but, I'll, but I'll tell you I'll tell you the thing that really really hit home. Um, yeah. It tells a story about how um, the internet used to be kind of like a club because it was not user friendly. It was not intentionally user hostile, but it was very very geeky. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, if you got onto Usenet, which was like the internet's message board, okay, mm-hmm. the fact that you were there meant that okay, I don't know who you are, uh, but. We have probably gone through similar life experiences. If you were, if you have heard of Usenet and you're interested enough in the internet and this concept to figure out how to get on there, and so I was on the Alt dot Books uh, sub, uh, Usenet, uh, uh, and we're talking about like I, don't, I forget how the conversation came up, but I came across. I said, "Oh yeah, there was this book 
uh, called the SAS Survival Guide that I saw at like Barnes and Noble, like on the clearance rack. And I'm sorry, a two, couple years ago, I'm sorry I didn't get it because it was really, really interesting with lots of little like diagrams and stuff like that. And then I'm, I'm in Boston and I get this and I get a reply from someone in New Zealand saying, well, actually that's in the corner of bookstore. I just want me to buy it for you. I said, oh, that'd be great. And like at, without with, and all that happened was like at the same time, he bought this book for me and mailed it to me. I like I forget how I did it, but some sort of like whatever international transfer. I sent him money. At the same yeah. time, neither of these two people having any solid knowledge that I'm going to get my money back or I'm going to get my book. Yeah, and just right. the fact that, well, I, I can kind of okay. Let, let, let's also be honest. We're talking about like 15 bucks. We're not talking about like you know a totally. million dollars but in crypto. Still, but it, still, exactly, it, it shows you there's this. If, if you're on this, if you're on Alt Books, I you're probably at least fifteen dollars worth of trustworthy. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're both there for the same reason. We're both, you yeah. know, excited about the fact that this could even happen. It's so easy to take that that sort of simple transaction for granted now. But at the time, that was a, a really big deal. The fact that there that the fact that you could use a computer in that way across the world and have any sort of, you know, kind of. Uh, commerce experience with someone else from there, and and yeah. that's that's awesome. Yeah, that and, was and, probably and and, yeah, and also really the crazy. feeling that um, um, I don't know if the word parasocial existed before the internet, but it was definitely necessary for it to be created. The idea mm -hmm. of here is a relationship that is real, but only to a certain extent. So that all books <laughs> right. was definitely a parasocial relationship where sure. I know of, and, and, and I used to, back in the old days, used to have to qualify to people. If I referred to somebody as my close personal friend, they knew that, okay, here's somebody that he knows through like the CompuServe, like comic book forum, uh, but has never actually physically met. He, he's upgraded right. to actual friend when I've actually like had lunch with them. Uh, <laughs> right. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the start of societies trying to figure out, uh, uh, especially on YouTube, I know so much about this person now. I know so much about their life. I know so much about their drama. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know about you, but isn't it so weird when, like, there's somebody who, like, on, on Instagram that you you enjoy their artwork, you really like them, you've bought like some of their stuff, maybe you support them on Patreon or whatever, and then uh, like they've had some sort of a family tragedy, uh, and like they've decided to uh, to publish about it, or write about it, and mm -hmm. now I'm like, do should I like? What, what is, what, if it's a friend, you know exactly what to do. If yeah, it's what a, is the appropriate it's, it's kind a, of it's like I don't, of, I, I know, I know this about you. I also know so much about your relationship with this person because you've been posting on Instagram about this person for like seven, eight, nine years. Like, mm -hmm. is it creepy for me to say, oh, well, I know that you, you I know that you love this person very much and you were very, very careful, Carol, uh, you're a very caring person, but if it's like, well, Again, is that a creepy thing for me to do? Because I don't know who you are. I don't really yeah. know. All I know I is know. the stuff that you posted. I don't. Have you ever exactly. gotten through stuff like that? Oh, for sure. And I mean, I think I think the the opposite side of that too, where when we as public people on the internet uh, meet someone who has followed our work. And, you know, uh, this actually just happened uh, not too long ago, you know, a handful of days ago in New York, where I, I got together for a drink with someone who definitely met online through podcasting and stuff. And, you know, he, he felt weird <clears throat> at, at one point asking me, like, about how is the family? How are your daughters? You know, because because he knows that I've shared what I've shared online. But he also realized, like, but I don't actually know them. <laughs> you right, know what I right. mean, and I only know what you've ever said on online. So yeah, it's it's an interesting kind of um, uh, kind of additional layer of how well we know people and how close, like, what closeness actually is yeah. in the in the in the the reality of you know this this modern age of the internet where we share so much about ourselves in many different ways and especially podcasting being the forum that it is it's a very intimate forum like Absolutely. i'm putting you your voice directly into my ears and you know going to hear every word that you say for the next hour every single week and yeah. people do attach to that that kind of feeling of like oh well I know this person I know, I know who they are well not only that but um, oftentimes you find that you've inserted yourself into people's lives in ways that you never expected 
like mm, mm, a, for sure. a, like you know your uh, uh, a family member is critically ill, and as I and unfortunately a lot of other people know, when you have like a parent who is critically ill, a lot of your time is spent being nearby but not being able mm-hmm. to do anything, but you just want to be nearby. And if this podcast helped you, you're just, I'm binge watching this, I'm binge listening to this podcast and it gave me a lot of strength. It gave me a lot of peace. It gave me a Comfort, lot of time out. Yep. And you don't know how, you feel as though you want to express that to that creator and mm-hmm. you hopefully are wanting to do it in a way that is not very creepy. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. they, because they uh, maybe they think that there's, this is going to be a quick, oh, well, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But there, we, I think we all have these people in our lives, uh, celebrities, writers, whatever, where it's like, boy, if I had five minutes to talk to this person, I would say, mm-hmm. "Your this thing that you made really helped me out." And of course, yep. you, you're trying to bookend it with, "I'm not, a, I don't, I don't think that you're a close personal friend of mine. I'm not going to be stalking or anything like that. <laughs> I just want you to know that, like, if you, uh, as we were, as you and I were talking about earlier on, like having a frustrating moment, or rec- trying to create the next episode of the podcast, the next column, the next book, the ne- next whatever. Yep. If you need a piece of strength, l- know that there are people out. You have no idea how, what good that you're creating just by creating. Uh, yeah, and then yeah, I, I, I mean, I've done I've done that one, uh, once or twice before, uh, and I I, I I feel like I'm I'm speaking like Luca Brazzi. You know, in The Godfather, which is like, <laughs> and now, Godfather, I know that you are a busy man, and I will leave you to the rest of the day. I simply thank you for having, you know, <laughs> because there's a, cause there's this uh, uh, a soprano, one of my favorite sopranos, Joyce DiDonato, has, uh, she does these master classes, uh, and they're all, or they're all over YouTube, and mm-hmm. they're not, and you would, as usually, you think of a master music master class as, oh, here's your technique. Oh, you need your place your your voice your vocal placement is here. It should be here. Or mm-hmm. it's she does them differently. She's mostly talking about the process of creation of creating this performance. And I spend that they're so inspirational to me uh, mm. because again, sometimes when I do feel like, oh man, I'm just stuck, I'll watch one of her master classes in which you know the 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 lesson is usually. You know, just be create. Basically, creativity is never a solved problem. It's not like great. Sure. I figured. I figured out how to write uh, write a tech review. Now I know how to do it. It's like no. Yeah, you, you wrote it's a, an ongoing process. Yeah. and so mm-hmm. you know, I, uh, at the Metropolitan Opera, you can go back. Uh, there's a artist interest area uh, that is very low key. It's like it's it's accepted that you know it's not. There'll be a small group of people that might be you know hanging out to say hi to people coming out. And so yeah, mm-hmm. it was like that. And I and she is so inspirational. There were like a lot of like students like hanging around and I, she, I, she happened to be like near me first. I'm like, I have to keep this short because it's, she's going to have a, the, when a student, when someone who's in their teens or like in the, in college age, like talks to someone like Joyce, that could be a life altering, like life boosting right. moment. I don't want to yeah. be, hi, I'm a middle-aged man about your age. <laughs> and I just want to say, I just want to say, I've watched all your, all your videos and I think they're, <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I but I did feel as though it was important to say, gosh, you're so, I'm, sure. I'm a writer and you ins- and you inspire me because I'm sure you and I have uh, you you as well have had these moments where someone said something really really nice to you and maybe you didn't 100 percent and it was like gosh that was so kind of them to say and it's oh, so good to know, that. Yeah. You know now that now that you're working for yourself uh, as well like. <laughs> you're you're in the house for <laughs> you're in the house alone. Oh, you don't, boy, you yeah, have no coworkers. You, you set you you hit send. You hit post, and you're not really sure that anybody's actually <laughs> yeah. actually reading it. And so it's good to know that like okay, good. This is yeah. This is I good. mean, I would say I would say in general, I would make the assumption personally that anyone who is a true creative, you know, creating something of value for themselves that they want to share with the world that they're choosing to share with the world would probably love to know the positive impact that that has on other people that people either liked it uh or you know or i guess if they had a critique that's that's fine too but i guess what i'm talking about more is like that 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 it that it connected with them on a similar level that maybe it connected with me when I create it. And yeah, I've certainly had yeah. that experience where someone shares that and I'm just like, ah, oh. and every time, like I'm just, I'm, I'm elated 
And like, oh man, thank you for sharing that because most people don't. Yeah. And it really does feel good to know that when you're creating something, there's people out there on the other side that yeah. you know are receiving the message or appreciating it or whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. There was a, let, let me let me tell you a quick story that I'm still like flabbergasted by. So I was at the yeah. uh, I was at the opening of the very first Apple Store in Soho, yes. and I was and because at, I think the opening was like at six of. It was going to go on for several hours. This, this was at Macworld Expo, so most of the people who are interested in going were probably had probably had dinner plans. They were keeping those dinner plans. So mm-hmm. for a good like half hour, mm-hmm. it was like me, Steve Jobs, and like twenty other people, maybe. Okay, and so uh, a name that I think you'll recognize, Colin Crawford, who was the publisher of Macworld, uh, was mm-hmm. there. And uh, I might be misremembering the specifics, but as, but anyway, so. Uh, Whoever it is, publisher was like uh, uh, talking to Steve Jobs about some of the books that he had written that his his house had written that was published uh, for for iLife I think at the time and took one of the books off the shelf there at the at the at the store and showed it to show Steve and Steve was like oh my god this is great he's flipping through he, he, and he didn't and Steve doesn't isn't a BSer but wow this is this shows everything this is perfect I, I remember he was saying this was perfect and like four months later I remember this incident. And I like I I I sent the email to the author saying that I don't think it's it's impossible that they didn't tell you about this, but just in case I thought I'd tell you and it gave you because it was fresh, so there was a lot more detail about it. And it was like, yeah. oh my god, Steve said that like this is great. Da, da, da. They had and no I'm idea, like, and it's like that sort of stuff will like, like oh, wow. especially as a book as a book writer, which is the most horrible job imaginable. It's like that will get you through another oh, like yes. twenty two hour day. And the, the and again, it's not important that you impress other people, but it's good to know that what you were trying to achieve was noticed and appreciated by somebody else. And if it's Steve Jobs, all the better. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's a pretty pretty awesome endorsement right there, um, Andy. I know I gotta let you go because we're we're bumping up on the time uh, that that we had agreed on, and I just want to let you know, like, I really appreciate the work that you do on an ongoing basis. You are a voice that I trust. I, I'm doing the thing now that we were just talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I appreciate your voice and technology, and I just, uh, yeah, just a, a big fan of of uh, you know all the 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 podcast that you've done over the years. I've worked pretty closely with your content in my time at, yep. at Twit. So um, I was fortunate enough to, to uh, listen to uh, your views on technology a lot over the years. And I just really appreciate you. Thank you for doing what you do and keep up the wonderful work. Where do you want people to go to kind of, you know, if you if you wanted to point people to one place to, to find what you're up to, where would that be? Uh, for now, uh, check out my socials. Uh, if, you sp- can, if we talked about like, you're, you're in the club if you can figure out how to get to using it. If you can spell my last name, I H N is in Nancy, A T is in Tom, K O, uh, on Instagram and Threads and elsewhere, uh, you'll be keeping up to date. I hope to have a, a brand new announcement of a new venture for my writing very, very oh, shortly. Excellent. It's been sub- it's been something I've been working on for a long, long time uh, because I want to make sure that I get it right. Uh, and I want to make sure I have systems. It's it's more ambitious than just oh I'll just occasionally write about this and that. Uh, but again, d- d- giving myself that venue that I miss that if I just want to write about it, I'll just write about it and I'll post it. So that's nearly done. And so so keep a keep in touch there uh, to my socials. We'll have hopefully announcement very very soon. Uh, as well as uh, check me out on the Mac Break podcast on Twit. Uh, the material podcast where we talk about Google on the Relay Network. And uh, if you go to uh, WGBHnews.org, you can listen to my occasional uh, 20 to 3 minute tech news roundup segments, Heidi Hose, uh, on Boston Public Radio. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. It was such Thanks, a pleasure I, I getting really to know this. you a little bit better. I really did too. Thank you for, uh, for being here with us today. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Huge thanks to our guest, Andy Anako. It was great catching up with Andy. Um, as for this show, all things Texploder can be found at Texploder.com. So if you've got one place you want to remember, just go to Texploder.com. The podcast premieres every Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on the Texploder YouTube channel with the audio podcast publishing to the feeds later that day. All can be found at the website. Texploder patrons get exclusive access to the live pre-recordings of these interviews as well as exclusive pre-show hangouts each and every week uh, right before the show uh, premieres on YouTube. You also get ad-free shows, early access to YouTube videos, a Discord community, and a whole lot more. 
And finally, we offer the chance to be an executive producer of this show. And if you do that, you get a Texploder t-shirt thrown in for good measure, just like this week's executive producers, Bill Rudder, Jeffrey Maraccini, John Cuny, Taylor Sunderhaas, and WPVM 103.7 in Asheville, North Carolina. Thank you all so very much for your support of what we're doing here with Texploder. Patreon.com slash Jason Howell. Thanks again to our guest, Andy Anotko. Thanks to you for watching and listening each and every week. I'm Jason Howell. I'll see you next time on a new episode of the Texploder podcast. Bye, everybody. <laughs>